do. I'm uh, I'm not one for small talk, really. I just like to cut to the chase. I will say this, though. I just like to see. I like to look and see everything that he does. Everything, every small, minuscule to the songs that we sing, you know. Nobody knows what my message is about. I don't, I don't typically tell people. Um, I don't tell Amanda, even though she lives in the same house. There might be some stuff in here that she's heard me say or touched on, but I definitely didn't talk to Mom. I didn't talk to Sister Gilda, so it's just kind of cool to watch him work. That's just uh, just how he is. That's awesome. All right, so if we'll get into it, uh, if you'll stand for the reading of God's Word, go turn with me to Revelation 1, 10 and 18. I'll give you some time, Brother Kevin. Hallelujah. If you're there, say amen. This is John speaking. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, under Pergamos, this one's hard, and Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and he turned, oops, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girded by the pass with a golden girdle, His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like a fine brass, and they burned as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. I want to ask a question. A question we all need to ask ourselves. Are you ready? Let us pray. Father, I love you, Jesus. I pray, Lord, that you would meet us right where we are. Meet us in this hour. Whether we are in the storm or in the valley, meet us. Whether we are in calm seas or on the mountaintop, Lord, I pray that you would pour your spirit out upon us. Anoint me to preach, hearts to receive, and minds to understand. In all that is done, we will give you glory. Because we know it is not us, but you that does the work. And all that loved him, shouted amen. Amen. You may be seated. John has been exiled to the island of Patmos, located in the Aegean Sea off the coast of Asia Minor, which is the name known as Turkey. Patmos was a barren, rocky, crescent island in John's day. It was about 10 miles long and less than 6 miles wide at its widest point. It served as a Roman penal colony, like Alcatraz. John was in the spirit. That means he was walking in an unclouded fellowship with Jesus and in a position to receive communication. This is not a dream. John was supernaturally transported out of the material world. He is not sleeping. He is transported to experience beyond the normal senses. This shows us that we must be near to the Lord to get the full experience. John was in the spirit on the Lord's day. This phrase appears many, many times early in Christian writings and refers to Sunday, the day of the Lord's resurrection. In today's Sunday? 
Suddenly, John heard behind him a voice with the clarity, volume, and the tone of a trumpet. The Lord's voice will get louder to signal that he is about to reveal something. It was Jesus telling him to write in a book. John was to write what he was about to see and send it to the seven churches. Now, when John hears the voice, he turns. He turns because it's deafening. The voice has his attention. Turning towards the speaker, John sees seven golden candlesticks, each one having a base, a single vertical stem, an oil burning lamp at the top. The person in the midst of the seven candlesticks was one like the Son of Man. There was nothing between the Lord and the candlesticks, no agency, no hierarchy or organization. There's nothing between his churches. The spirit ransacks the realm of nature for symbols that might convey some faint conception to our dull and finite minds of the glory, splendor, and the majesty of the coming one, who is Christ of Revelation. The Lord is clothed with a garment of the Old Testament high priest because he is risen and in heaven performing his ministry of intercession. For this reason, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. The Lord liveth to make intercession for them, for us. And 60 years after Christ's death and resurrection, John sees him as a high priest in the heavenlies. His hair and his head were like, were like wool, as white as snow, not a flat white, but a blinding white, like when steel is heated. The hotter the steel gets, the lighter the color becomes. Steel heated to just over 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit is glowing white. Picture that. That's what John saw, not in a dream, not in a vision. He is there. This pictures his eternity as the ancient of days, also showing his wisdom and purity of his judgment. His eyes were like a flame of fire. It speaks of his perfect knowledge, his infallible insight. It is an inescapable scrutiny. His eyes were like two lasers. The eyes of the exalted Lord look with a penetrating gaze. He stares into the depths of the soul with this gaze. He can see our deepest secrets. He knows our deepest dreams, wants, and our worst fears. He can see it all. Nothing, I mean nothing, hides from the Lord. His feet were like polished brass, and his voice was the sound of many waters. Brass, brass is the symbol of judgment, and his voice sounded like the waves of the sea, majestic and awesome. His voice sounded like roaring surf breaking against a rocky shoreline. This is the voice of authority. He held in his right hand seven stars that show his possession, power, control, and honor. These seven stars are the messengers who represent the seven churches. Christ holds them in his hand, which means that he controls the church and its leaders. Out of his mouth went a two-edged sword, which we know is the word of God, his infallible word, his all-powerful word, his everlasting word. From the beginning, when the Lord created, he spoke it into existence. When the Lord was on the earth, he spoke it. And it happened. He didn't wave his arms around and say some magic words. He spoke life and it was poured out. His countenance was, a ra was r as radiant as the sun at high noon. The dazzling splendor and transcendent glory of his deity. This is Christ. This is the one true God. This is the almighty Jesus. Are you ready? For what? For what you are about to see. When John sees him, he falls at his feet as he was dead. When you stand in the presence of the Most High, you will have no choice. When the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is in the room, every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess, he is Lord. I remember uh, a story that uh, I read about Smith Wigglesworth. He, uh, 
He was doing a camp meeting or a revival for a, for a church. And after the meeting, they would have a prayer meeting. And so uh, everybody would gather in the in the sanctuary, and they would start praying. And uh, when Smith would enter, he would come straight to the front. And as he prayed, the longer he prayed, one by one, people would leave. The last one would be him in the in the pastor of the church. Eventually, he left too. The only person went in there was Smith. So about Wednesday or Thursday, probably midweek, it might have been Tuesday or Wednesday, I'm not really sure. But the old pastor said, I'm not leaving. I want to see what's going on in there. So sure enough, like clockwork, Smith comes in and goes to the front, starts praying. One by one, people start leaving. The old pastor stands there, and he's praying, and he feels the push. Lord, I, I don't want to leave. Don't let me leave. He feels the push. Lord, I, I don't, I don't, don't let me leave. I want, I want to see what's going on. Don't make me leave. He feels the push. Now he's on his knees. Lord, please don't make me leave. He still feels the push. Now he's on the ground, and he's screaming to the Lord, please don't let me leave, Lord, please don't let me leave. So in the event, he grabs a hold of a big, huge oak chair, and he holds on to it for dear life. Lord, I don't want to leave. Don't let me leave. Don't make me leave, please, Lord. All of a sudden, him and the chair are pushed out the door, and the door shuts. He can't stand because he's not holy enough. He's not sanctified enough to stand in that true presence of the Lord. Smith was the only one in that, in that room. I should tell us something. You want to stand in that presence, we got to be holy as he is holy. As John is lying on the ground, the Lord touches him and tells him, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Jesus is saying, I was then who I am now. I change not. I am forever and ever. Amen. He tells John, I have the keys to hell and of death. Christ controls all. The Lord controls who dies, who lives, and when. He has control all in the palm of his hand. Nothing happens without his say. But why is John exiled to a barren wasteland? It's an island for murderers and thieves. Let's look at the life of John. He wrote five New Testament books, the Gospel of John, three short epistles that bear his name, and the book of Revelation. But before he wrote these books, he was a fisherman with his brother James. Till one day Jesus walks by and calls him to follow him. John is the youngest of the 12 disciples, and, his, and the two brothers, James and John, are called the sons of thunder by Jesus for their zeal because they wanted to call fi fire down below fire from above for some non-believing Samaritans. John, along with James and Peter, are Jesus' inner circle. They see Jesus do more miracles, talk to Moses and Elijah. They are there with Jesus in the garden when he goes to pray. And on the cross, Jesus tells John to take care of his mother. John is known as the disciple who, who Jesus loved. John becomes one of the main pillars of the early church. He teaches and preaches the gospel. He's the only disciple to die of old age. The rest of the apostles were killed for their faith. The Romans tried to boil John in oil, but he was unharmed. And they could not kill him. They banished him to the island of Patmos. And all that John had seen and done for the kingdom, this is it. Stuck on an island with nowhere to go. And he is alone, isolated from his family, from his church, and from his ministry. And then I bet the devil comes around to remind him. Isn't that just like it? The devil's going to say, well, looks like you've messed up now. Look at what following Jesus got you. Banished to a barren wasteland for prisoners. 
you can't even die. They tried to kill you, and it didn't work. So here you are alone. <laughs> now what? I guess you would just rot here on this island all the rest of your days. Maybe John is feeling sorry for himself. He starts to pray, Lord, why don't you love me? I don't understand. Why am I here? Why am I alone? Why have you forsaken me? I bet John reads off a list of what he had done for the kingdom. Lord, I spread your word. I have fed your sheep. I even cared for your mother. Why have you left me here to rot? Do we get like that sometimes? Do we pray that way sometimes? Is it only me? Maybe I'm just preaching to myself today. Do we think the Lord should answer every prayer when we want them answered? And in the timetable that we want them answered in? Do we? The Lord is not a vending machine where you can insert your prayers and pick what you want to come out. Hmm. Oh, I think I want some wealth. Oh, give me wealth. Boop, boop, B6. Ah, there we go. Put it in my pocket. Thank you. Or I want you to heal me. Or heal so-and-so. We pray, Lord, heal me. Heal them. Oh, here we go. A8. Boop. Oh, here we go. All right, poof, I'm healed. It worked that way. I'm not saying that he can't do that, and I'm not saying that he won't. I'm saying, do we expect him to do what we want when we want it? Or do we think the Lord is a genie? If you rub the lamp, he's going to give you three wishes. The Lord is not a vending machine or a dude in a lamp that grants wishes. Sometimes I think we walk this life as followers of Jesus and we don't really realize who we have contact with. We believe the Lord is a talisman or a lucky charm of some kind that we only use when we have no other option or we get it over our heads. We decide that we're going to do it ourselves. Uh-oh. Man, I'm in trouble now. I kept Jesus right here in my pocket. Lord, that didn't work. Lord, are you going to save me? Where are you at? Is that how we get? Is that how we use him? We keep the Lord in our back pocket, and we pull him out when the heat is applied, when the fire is too hot for us to handle. And when he doesn't show up or come through like we want him to, we get in our feelings. We get mad or upset about it. Then we give him the cold shoulder. Amen. And thank the Lord for his mercy. Do we pray sometimes and we think it should happen a certain way? And if it doesn't, we try to make it happen. Then we are all about our own will being fulfilled and not doing the will of the Father. Jesus said, my meat is to do the will of the Father. And our will should be to be to do likewise. What would it be if Jesus prayed in the garden, take this cup from me, and left it at that? Never said anything else, just left. And expected the Father to remove him from his mission. Then where would the, the world really would be in a mess then? I wouldn't be standing up here, I can tell you that. Praise the Lord that he did not. And he knew the Father's will. People will say, Smith Wigglesworth only prayed once and believed. And he got what he prayed for. True. That you know of. That's all that's written. We don't know what prayers were not answered. But Smith knew the Father's will. Smith prayed constantly. I heard a story about Smith. One day a preacher came to London. I don't know the preacher's name. You've got to figure this is in the 1900s. Preacher came to London. He was going to preach for a pastor's revival. The young preacher says to the pastor, I see that we're close to Brantford. And I've never met Brother, Brother Wigglesworth. The pastor says, Oh, Smith is a good friend of mine. 
we will go and see him. So the two men drive to Smith's house and go in. They start talking to him. Smith says to the preacher, you have a car, don't you? Yes, sir. Good. Drive me to the park. Okay. So they drive him to the park. They're walking up the steps like the park's uh, kind of hilly, so it's got some steps, and then it'll have like a, a platform, some chairs and stuff. So they drive to the park. They're walking up the steps. Smith says, I'm tired. I'm going to sit on this bench a little while. Y'all keep walking. So the men did. The visiting preacher is confused. He came to see Smith. Now he's just walking around the park with this pastor. When the two men come back to where Smith was sitting, they see that he's he's sitting between and ministering to a young couple. He leads the young couple to the Lord, and when the couple leave, they're holding hands and laughing. When the two men approach Smith, Smith says, okay, you can take me home now. The father's work is done. The two men look at Smith, very confused. The young preacher who wanted the Smith says, I don't get it. I came to see you, and I just walked around in the park. Smith said, I knew you were coming to see me. The young preacher says, ain't no way you could have known that. I did. Father told me. He told me you were coming, and he told me that you had a car and that you could drive me to the park where I was to wait on a young married couple that had only been married about six months, and they needed Jesus. So I came and waited for them, and when I saw them, they were walking on opposite sides of the sidewalk. They were not even talking to one another. So I called to them, hey, I said that you two were newly married and had been fighting. I led them to Jesus, and he fixed all the problems and restored their marriage. And now that his father's business is done, we can go home. Smith lived and walked in the spirit. He never prayed more than 20 minutes, but he never went more than 20 minutes without praying. He knew the father's will, and he has only, and he was only about the father's business. I'm not saying don't pray and don't believe. I'm saying we, we pray for the Lord's will to be done. He will answer prayers. He just might not answer them in the way that we think. So we have to be seeking and praying and believing before his will to be done. Because if it's the Father's will, nothing can stop it from happening. No man can stop it. No demon can stop it. The Lord will speak, and it will happen. It just might not always be on our timetable. If the Lord has given you a word, you know that he said he would do whatever you're praying for. You have that word in your heart that he will do it. Don't let the devil rob you of that. Sometimes prayers are answered fast, and sometimes they are not. Are you ready for what? To believe God. Let me show you how the Lord works. This is just a small hint to his great and almighty power. I was not raised in church. I don't even really remember going to church when I was young. I never faulted anybody for going. This wasn't for me. I grew up, got married, had kids. Amanda was raised in church. Her and the kids would go. I came sometimes, but not often. So years go by. Man, it's not really fully serving the Lord. It's more of a routine. She goes to church, but there's no true walk. She's going through the motions. That's probably mostly my fault. If I was doing what I was supposed to be doing, then she wouldn't have been there. But the Lord works it all out for a reason. The year is 2012. The life I have is a balancing act between rage and death. The depression that I have been fighting for, fighting for most of my life is now winning. Our marriage is on its last thread, and divorce looms in the distance. Our relationship is nowhere what, nowhere to what it is now. We are like two passing ships in the night. There's no team. We are roommates. 
I'm in such a state of depression that it's all I can do not to lose it. I function normally only outside. I go to work. I do things around the house. The family is a fading thought. But on the inside, it's war. I'm fighting hard day and night not to end this life. I think of drowning myself in the pool or blowing my brains out with a pistol. I am tired. Life has not become what I thought it would have been. I'm angry 90% of the time. I would rather bash people's heads in than to talk to anybody. There are some times man and me don't talk for days. I'm trying to hold it together for her and the kids. I love them. I can't imagine life without them, but I can't be around anybody. I work a lot, 60, 70, 80 hours a week. Work, it seems, is the only thing to keep the demons at bay. I can keep my mind focused on fixing trucks, and I don't have to think of anything else. But the darkness is closing in. The demons are coming, and I'm about to give up. Then one night, me and Amanda were talking, and she says, I'm done. She can't live this way anymore. And I finally realized I broke her. It's about to all come crashing down. So we talk and we try to reconcile our marriage. We're trying to rekindle our love. And it all seems okay until 2013. February 2013, on the way to work, I got into a car crash. I was hit from behind. I was hit so hard that it bent the frame of my truck six inches up and drove the bed of the cab two inches. It knocked me two full car lengths before I got the truck stopped. But when I got out of the truck, I stepped out and heard a pop. And I felt a pop when I... I felt a pop in my back. But my truck was so hurt, I was like, oh, (laughs) my truck. So I didn't really think much of it. I called Amanda to tell her what happened. Actually, I think I had to uh, get her to bring me the insurance card because we had new insurance cards, and the one I had was expired. She came up there, told me I needed to go to the hospital. I went. They did x-rays. Everything was good. I had already called work, made a, made what adjustments needed to be made, and I went home and played video games with ice on my back. Next day, I go to work. My back is sore. It keeps getting sore, and it hurts. So I tell her, make me a doctor's appointment. I need to go to the doctor. He it says it's soft tissue injury. Just my back. Just put ice on and take it easy. A couple of days later, I went. I went to look at a truck in the yard. And when I reached to take a pipe off, I fell to the ground. It was like a it was like a hard knife stabbing me right in my back. Now I can't get up, and I'm about five hundred yards away from the shop. And I left my phone on my toolbox. I laid there for about fifteen minutes before a coworker came by. He held me up. When I got back to the shop, I told man <laughs> made me a doctor's appointment that this ain't right. Time goes by. I've been out of work for about two months. I had to call a friend of mine just to pay the house payment. I have long-term disability or short-term disability, but that company says that, mm, nah, your auto insurance should pay for your uh, your salary. No, nah, no, dude, that's not the way it works. My back hurts so bad that I can only sit for 15 minutes, stand for 15 minutes, and lay down for 15 minutes before I have to change positions. The doctors can't find anything wrong with my back. From x-rays to MRIs, and now I'm on pain meds, anti-inflammatory. I randomly fall and have to catch myself because my back gives out. I've been taking the pain meds for a while and anti-inflammatory. Now the doctors have added a nerve blocker. The nerve med and the anti-inflammatory are scheduled meds. And the pain is as needed. 
first time I take the three close together, I notice something different. My mind is racing fast. It's already hard to sleep with the pain. And now my mind going to 90 mile an hour makes it even tougher. This is weird. The next day I take three med I take the three meds closer together. Before I took I took the pain medicine 30 minutes before I took the other two. This time I take them all three at once. It's worse. My mind is all over the place. And it's late at night and everyone's asleep. I'm happy one minute and rage the next. They're like five minute highs and lows. Happy, sad, happy, sad within within two to five minutes of each other. It's a bad dream. <laughs> it's not a dream. It's a bad trip. The depressive state is so heavy, I'm about to shoot myself in the house. I have to get out of here. For me, there is no other way. I have to end it. So I write man a Dear Jane letter, grab my phone, wallet, some extra socks, a Pop-Tart. <laughs> Don't ask me. And my pistol. Last meal, I guess. Grab the keys to our SUV, because my truck is still in the shop. It's four in the morning. And as I drive down over uh, as I drive down the road, any lights I see, you know, I have tracers. It's all I can. It's so hard to focus. It's hard to think I can barely drive. It's hard to go to speed limit. I find myself going twenty miles under the speed limit. And then I speed up. And then just to find myself, oh, man, I'm going 20 miles under the speed limit again. This is back and forth, back and forth. I have to fight to keep the car on the road. I can't drive to the beach like this. I will never make it. So I stop at a local park. Meanwhile, Amanda wakes up to go to work. She finds a note. She checks the house. I'm not in the house. SUV is gone, along with my phone and my wallet. She calls. I don't answer. She asks for one more item. It's missing. I have left and taken the last Pop-Tart. Now she is mad. I'm just kidding. She didn't know I had any food with me, and she don't eat Pop-Tarts. No, she has found that my gun is missing. She calls. No answer. She calls several times. No answer. Now, as I sit in the car, I'm just thinking, it's time this is over. I'm so tired. My mind is exhausted. I have no fight left in me. As I say goodbye in my mind to my family and my friends, the gun is cold in my hand. Staring at the gun, I think, I have fought as long and as hard as I could. That's the end of the road for me. Amanda can't get through to me. She doesn't know where I am, which way to go, or where to look. She's in full panic mode. She makes it to our closet. She knows that they will find me later dead in the woods somewhere with a self-inflicted gunshot wound. She can only she can only do one thing now. As she collapses, she cries out to the Lord, Lord, if you will keep him safe. And let him answer and let me know he is okay. I will serve you the rest of my life. The next time she called, I answered. She says, where are you? I'm at the park. I'm coming to you. You stay there. She shows up. We talk. We go to the doctor to find out what happened. I already decided to stop taking the meds. When I go to the doctor, she asked me exactly to explain exactly how it was. I said, have you ever done LSD? And she said, no. Do I look like I do LSD? I 
I don't know. I'm just asking a question. It's the only way. If you've never done LSD, you will never you will never understand. It's almost like a full psychotic break. Usually, when you do mind altering drugs, you stay up for a while and then you crash. Not this. This was so rapid, up and down, up and down. You couldn't stand it. The mind was about about mush. I stopped taking the meds. We worked stuff out. We stayed together. What very few know is that the Lord woke up Brother Jamie. And he can't pinpoint to me when, but I know when. The Lord woke him up, told him to start praying at about 3 or 4 in the morning. The Lord knows all and controls all. Man, I went on to serve the Lord from this time. I did not. Until four years later. That was a hard four years, just ask her. Praying for my salvation as I got meaner every day. Then one day, she got this feeling that she was supposed to be a minister's wife. And she thought, oh no, I goofed up the Lord's plan. Should me and Paul even be together? She says, Lord, I don't understand. And then on a normal Wednesday night in April, no revival, no special service, I was here before anybody except for Brother Jamie. That's when I started to serve the Lord. Are you ready for what? To believe God. It might take some time for your prayers to be answered. You might have to pound heaven with prayers and cries to the Lord, but the Lord will give you scripture when he gives you a word. The Apostle John was exiled in 84 A.D., and he was let go in 86 A.D. So for two years he sat on that rock, and for what? The greatest revelation of Christ we have written. The Lord just might have to put, the Lord just might put John, or hap, I can't say that, He just might have put John on that island so he could totally focus on Jesus and nothing else. Not chores that have to be done. Not going to a job, family issues, not dealing with church problems, nothing. The Lord wanted John all to himself so Jesus could give him a very important message. John is the last disciple left and placed on this rock because the Romans couldn't kill him. But the Lord gave him a word, didn't he? Jesus told the disciples in Matthew 16 and 28, Verily I say unto you, There will be some standing here which shall not taste the death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And when John was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, he saw just that. And he wrote it in a book for us all to read. Are you ready for what? to believe God if the Lord has given you a dream you hold on to that dream he will make a way if the Lord has given you a word of life that he will restore you you hold on to that word you keep praying you keep praising you keep believing the Lord is working if you are doubting or starting to you need to get in this altar Until you get a word from the Lord, Christ must come. He has to be the only revelation for the dream to come true. He has to be the one who saves and heals. He might do it through someone, but it's in his power, by his spirit, that everything is done. Even after the ordeal in 2013, I didn't see the Lord in that. I still was in the valley of death like a soldier with no armor. In the middle of the battle, I was broken. It was only getting darker in the valley of the shadow, and I was hopeless. I never thought that I would ever see the day when every chain would break or hear the voice of heaven call my name.
Then in 2017, he came to me. He called me home. He saved and delivered me from depression. Then Christ came, changing everything. He took my sin and shame away. Now every song I sing will be for him. Ever since the moment he walked in, the Lord used that accident and me being hurt to get to Amanda. And by getting to her, he got to me. You might be the link to someone's miracle. You might be the one to stand in the gap and pound heaven's door with prayer till the Lord goes out and gets his lost sheep. You stand and I'll close with this. In our text, we have the revelation of who we serve. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the first and the last. The beginning and the end. He controls all and knows all. He has the keys of hell and of death. He created all and he can destroy all. He's the God of the universe. He is Jesus. Are we ready for what? believe God Lord I have delivered your message I pray that it finds good ground help us all to understand who we call upon when we call upon your name at your name every knee will bow at your name every tongue will confess help us Lord to understand that you will take care of your sheep your children just remind us that you know best and to help us walk in your will. Lord, meet us around these altars. We will give you honor, glory, and praise in all that you do. And in Jesus' name, amen. Come, let's meet Jesus around these altars. Let's give him honor and glory.